So now that we've taken a look at dispersion and how the rainbow happens, I'd like to turn our attention to uh, image formation and um, lenses. So we'll start by thinking a bit about image formation, and I'll start by saying, you know, have you ever looked, say, at a fish underneath the surface of the water? Um, so here we got ourselves a little fishy. And if you're above looking at the uh, fish it, it, here outside the water, it will seem like the fish is too close compared to how, how far down it really is. So why is that? Well, let's go and draw a couple rays here. So let's just draw one ray that's looking straight up like this. And then let's say draw another one and practice, <clears throat> since we're thinking about rays of light that would actually enter the pupil of your eye, these angles would be very small. But I want to make it a little more distinct here. So let's say you're spreading out here at some angle theta 1. Well, by Snell's law, um, so this is n1, this is n2, and n1 here is greater than n2, um, you're going to bend away at some uh, bigger angle, theta2, right here. We can go ahead and track this back, and we can see that these rays would intersect right here which means this is where you would actually see your fish. Now, I greatly exaggerated it, but we can estimate how thick this is. So I'll kind of gloss over the derivation, just motivate the result. The result is that the depth of our fish here, um, which this is a virtual image since you can't form it on a screen, will be minus, and again, that's just to follow our sign conventions. This just means it's a virtual image. Um, we'll say that S is our depth here. It'll be minus N2 over N1 times S. So now, if this was air and water, air, N2, would be 1, and water is about 4 thirds. So this would make it 3 quarters, so when you see a fish underwater, they look like they are 25% closer than they actually are. And you have the same sort of deal too if you're going snorkeling or something like that, because since you've got air next to your eyes, right, um, you're going to have the same foreshortening effect uh, when you're looking at um, what's happening underwater. Alrighty, so let's talk about making lenses here. Um, so, whoops. All right, there's our optical axis. Now, what will, and let me just draw something flat here. This will be called the principal plane of the lens. Now, let's just say for, now we've got a converging lens here. So what will happen is if we've got a um, bunch of parallel rays of light all coming into the lens. They will all, with some caveats here, refract to a common focus. Now we're getting those caveats in just a second here.
All right. So in order to truly get everything to go to a common focus, first off, the surfaces would have to be um, not spherical. They would have to be parabolic or hyperbolic, but we'll go ahead and use spherical surfaces anyway. In practice, this means that things aren't going to quite come to a perfect focal point, but we will call this point here the focal point anyway. The second thing you'll notice is I showed all the refraction happening at a point in the middle. This, this does not actually happen. Um, refraction actually happens here and here. However, if the lens is thin, and most lenses are thin, um, then we can pretend that all the refraction happens at a point called, at a plane called the principal plane of the lens. So this is just an approximation, but it's a very good one. The um, correction terms are quite small for most practical lenses. This, by the way, is why, if you, assuming you don't have astigmatism, if you look through your glasses backwards, it does just as good of a job. All right, so with that, and also what's different here with a lens versus a mirror is that there's also going to be a matching focal point over here. Because since we can pretend all the, for a thin lens, we can pretend all the refraction happens right here it doesn't matter which way you use the lens. So I could just as easily been sending parallel rays of light coming in from the right, and they would have come to a focus over here at the left. And this is what's actually going to allow us to form images. So for instance here, um, I'll go ahead draw an optical axis in a principal plane and a little cartoon of a lens. Um, we'll get into how to draw these ray diagrams more in a second. I just want to get to a result right now. Um, say I have an object here. Um, it'll turn out that we can draw the same, um, we can look at two particular rays. We can look at the ray that comes off of this parallel. We know from the definition of, of the focal point that it would have to refract and go through the focus. Now, the other ray that we can think about is going to be the central ray. There we go. Um, it, only, it does technically get shifted a little bit here and a little bit here, but the shift is very small. And in the limit of a thin lens, it turns out that a ray heading for the intersection of the optical axis and the principal plane pretty much just goes through undeflected. So then you can see the two rays intersect over here. So we form an image over here. So let's go ahead and say that our object height is h and our image height is h prime and we'll say that our object distance is s and our image distance is s prime now here in this example s prime would be positive because it's a real image it's one you can form on a screen 
So don't pay attention to the, when you're thinking about whether an image is real or virtual, don't pay attention to the, what side of the optical device it's on. Ask yourself whether it can be formed on a screen, real, or if you have to look through the device to see it, virtual. So anyway, much like we did with mirrors, it turns out that we can play some games with similar triangles. Um, one pair of similar triangles you can focus on is this pair of green ones. <coughs> and then the other pair, <coughs> excuse me, that we can focus on are these purple ones right here. And again, you can set up the proportionalities from the uh, similar triangles. And I will just quote the results that we get. The results that we get is that the magnification, which is going to be the, the lateral magnification, which is h prime over h, um, will be equal to minus s prime over s, which is exactly what we saw for um, when we were doing this with mirrors. We will also see that 1 over s plus 1 over s prime equals 1 over f. Now here, this gets the name the thin lens equation. But I mean, honestly, this is why I call it the most useful equation in optics, because it looks identical to the mirror equation. Alrighty. So... One thing that we isn't quite so clean, though, is how to get these focal lengths from the details of construction. Remember, for a mirror, you just took the radius and divided it by 2. And yes, we are following the same kind of sign conventions as before. Um, and it's a tedious derivation that I don't think is too terribly instructive. So I'm going to quote the result and say it comes just from a detailed analysis of Snell's law at both the front and back surfaces of a, uh, of a lens. And you obtain what's called the lens maker's equation. And I'm going to write it a little more generally than a lot of books choose to write it. Um, and I'll get into why in just a second. So the result that you get um, is that one over the focal length, something that we will eventually call the refractive power, but for now we'll just say one over the focal length, will be equal to the index of refraction of the material over the index of refraction of the medium that the material is in, minus 1, times 1 over the radius of curvature of the first surface that the light hits, minus 1 over the radius of curvature of the second surface that the light hits. Now, in a lot of books, they just say, hey, it's in air, right? So you'll, they just go ahead and substitute one in directly for the medium. Um, I prefer not to do that. For one thing, in um, certain kinds of microscopes, the optics are actually submerged in oil rather than air. So in that case, you would need to put in the index of refraction for the, uh, for the oil in question. Um, and also it leads to a thing that you believe it or not air itself can be a lens so let's get so we'll get into that as we head on so we can broadly categorize our lenses um, so for converging lenses With converging lenses, the focal length will be positive, just like with a converging mirror, the focal length is positive. Now, what I'm drawing here 
is going to correspond to if the lens material has a higher index than the surrounding medium. So in this case here, um, the one that you've been seeing me draw so far is a design called a biconvex lens. This surface is convex, this surface is convex. It'd be concave if it's going in like a cave, but this is here to vex you. So if we have light, say, coming in from the left here, the light is first going to strike this surface. That makes this surface R1. And by the definitions of the left light convention, because the light struck the surface before it got to the center of curvature, that makes this a positive radius of curvature. And then here, the light will then hit this surface here. So this is surface number two. Now its center of curvature is here. Sorry, I didn't say R1 is equal to one. I just wanted to say it was positive. So here, this the light hits this surface second. So that makes this radius R2. Now, because the light hit the center of curvature, past the center of curvature, before it passed the, um, before it actually got to the surface, in the left light convention, that makes that a negative radius of curvature. So, following through in the lens maker's equation, 1 over r1 will be positive, 1 over r2 will be negative, but we're subtracting it makes both of those terms positive, we'll have a positive focal length. Um, other designs that, that you might see. Um, sometimes it is useful to have one of the surfaces be flat. Um, this is called a planar convex uh, lens. So here, this is still surface number one, but the radius of curvature of this surface is infinity. So what that means is when you go and stick infinity in here, you'll have one over infinity gives you zero. And that makes sense because parallel rays coming in here, but I'll be striking on the normal and just pass straight through. Um, you'll sometimes see designs like this in certain kinds of microscopes. And then a very common one is for eyeglasses. Um, with eyeglasses, this would be a lens that you would write for somebody if they were farsighted. Um, this is a design called meniscus convex. And the point of this design is that the thickness is as uniform as possible across the lens while still actually being able to do something. So you can see here, um, the, the thickness varies wildly here. Here, this design is the minimum variation in thickness you can have. And this has advantages for eyeglasses because it um, helps to minimize distortions that you have from the fact that although we pretend the lenses are thin, in practice they aren't. Um, or, you know, in, in th this is the closest we can do to making it thin, let's put it that way. This will minimize distortions you would get. If you tried to make a lens like this, um, you would definitely notice distortions in your field of view as you look toward the top or the bottom of the lens. Here, this minimizes the distortions. <clears throat> so as long as the index of the material is greater than the surrounding uh, material, a uh, surrounding medium, um, you'll notice that all the converging lenses are fatter in the middle, and this is a distinguishing trait. You can also make diverging lenses. So these will be ones with negative focal lengths. So these are ones that will try to spread rays of light away from a focus. Um, so here we could imagine, say, 
a design that looks like this. This is usually what they put in a textbook. This gets called biconcave because this end is concave, goes in like a cave. This end is concave, goes in like a cave. Again, that's the surface one, that's surface two, incident light here. So this is surface one, so now this is R1 because the light hits this surface first, but it passed the center of curvature first before it got to the surface. So that makes this radius of curvature negative. Then the light gets to this surface, so that makes the radius of this surface R2, because it's the second surface, and because the light hits this surface before it gets to the center, and that makes R2 positive. Going back to the lens maker's equation then, that's going to make this a negative number here, this is a positive number, negative minus positive is negative, we end up with a negative focal length. Again, assuming that the index of refraction is um, of the uh, lens is greater than the surrounding medium. Similarly, you can have a planar concave lens. So that's just one where the surface is flat. And again, this is infinity. If you ask should be plus or minus infinity, it doesn't matter. One over infinity either way is still zero. And somewhere I just made a math professor very unhappy. And then finally, if you have eyeglasses written for nearsightedness, your glasses are, whoops, probably, oh, come on, we can do a better job than this. Probably ground something like this. This is a design called meniscus concave. And you can see here it's thinner in the middle than on the edges, but again, it stays as close to uniformly thick as possible in order to minimize distortions for the wearer. <clears throat> now, I keep making the caveat about you know the material here being having a higher index than the surrounding medium. So if that's the case here, where it's skinnier in the middle, it's diverging. But let's say that you had like a bubble that got trapped in glass. Now it's rare, but it's not completely unheard of to have a bubble that's sort of vaguely shaped like this trapped in glass. If that's the case, the you've made yourself a lens out of air that is surrounded by glass. In that case there, by the lens maker's equation, um, this fraction here now is going to be less than 1, and so that reverses the sign. So instead of this being a diverging lens now, if this is air here surrounded by glass, if it's an air bubble in glass, you now have a converging lens and a potential fire risk if you're making a, uh, a glass window. It's rare, but it's a thing. Alrighty. So let's go ahead and work, how, work out how to draw ray diagrams and then we'll work an example with of the uh, most useful equation in optics. So with ray diagrams, um, it turns out that ray diagrams fall in the exact same four cases that we had for mirrors, but we have to draw them a little differently because, you know, it's a lens. So the first um, case is where the object distance is greater than two focal lengths and the, it is a converging lens. So in that case there, let me go ahead. We'll draw an optical axis and a principal plane. And honestly, when you're drawing ray diagrams with lenses, all you ever really need to do is draw the principal plane because all of the action is happening there. But I find it helpful to draw a cartoon of the lens on here. 
and I'm actually going to intentionally make it a very small cartoon just to show you what to do if you um, actually have to think about a very small lens. So what you'll do is put dots equidistant on either side at the focal length. And here we said that we were going to be more than two focal lengths out to our object over here. And notice that, yes, my object is bigger than my lens. Hey, that happens with your eye, right? Um, so it turns out it's still the same three rays as before. The paraxial ray. Oops. There we go. The paraxial ray will go to the principal plane and bend out through the focal point. Now, if this were describing an actual physical system, this ray would not actually be contributing to making the image. So this is why um, you see like the cameras that sports photographers use have enormous lenses it's just so they can literally catch more rays of light coming in. But even though this ray doesn't actually contribute to making the image, we can still pretend it does for the purposes of locating the image. All right, secondly, for the focal ray, keep in mind the idea of the focal ray is say, okay, well, I can reverse this and say if I had a parallel ray going like this, I'd have to go through the focus like that, and then you take it backward. Same idea here. The focal ray will go through, come on. Ah, there we go. The focal ray will go through the near focal point and go out There we go, parallel. And then finally, the central ray is still your truest, bestest friend. In, in, in lenses, it just shoots through undeflected. There we go. And if I were a better artist, these would have intersected. Oh, well. Anyway, there's my image, which can be formed on a screen. So it is real. We see it's upside down, so it's inverted. And we see it's smaller, so it's minified. All right, let's take on... Actually, this is a good opportunity as any here. Before we move on to case two, um, I have a little puzzle for you in this video clip here. So what you're seeing here is a light source that has a little picture of a crosshair in front of it. There's a lens, converging lens here, and there's a screen down at the end. In a moment, I'll uh, turn off the lights, and what I will be doing is covering the top half of the lens with an index card. I would like you to predict what's going to happen to the image. Pause the video, and when you're ready, we'll resume. All right, so here we go. We're going to cover up the top half of the lens. Did that match what you predicted? All right, so it turned out the image just plain got dimmer. This is because there are still plenty of rays of light that could pass through the bottom half of the lens, and they still all converge to make the image. So that's why we just saw it get dimmer. All righty. So let's go ahead and do case two. Um, So in case two, the object distance is between one and two focal lengths, and it is a converging lens. So same deal here, optical axis, 
principal plane. Again, all you really need to do is draw the principal plane, but I always find it helpful to draw a lens just to remind myself whether I'm converging or diverging. Mark the focal points equidistant, and then we'll go and park our object, say, out here. All right, this, this one gets drawn exactly the same way as case one. So paraxial ray comes in and goes out through the focal point. The focal ray passes through the focal point to the principal plane, comes out parallel. Looks like I'm going to need to extend this one a bit. There we go. And then, as always, the central ray, it's our truest, bestest friend, passing through the intersection of the principal plane and the optical axis. Again, my artwork isn't 100% perfect, but we can see that we would form an image on a screen. So this image is real. It is inverted and it is magnified. All right. So now let's go ahead and look at case three. So this is still a converging lens, but now the object is inside the focal point. So this is going to turn out to correspond with uh, Sherlock Holmes's magnifying glass here. Um, optical axis. Principal plane. Draw the cartoon here. I'm going to park the focal points a little further out. There we go. And because I know it's going to happen, I'm going to make my object not terribly big. There we go. So there's my object. Um, so again, same deal as before. The parax whoops, the paraxial ray will come in and go out through the focal point. Now with the focal ray, the focal ray is going to have to be the ray that's lined up with this focal point over here. Because remember the idea is we're trying to find the parallel ray that would come in and refract back and just graze through the top here. So again, if you want to do dotted lines, but not dashed to help guide you, that's fine. Um, and so then the focal ray will refract out parallel. So I think we can already see that we are never going to form a real image. And then finally, the central ray is our truest, bestest friend. All right, so it's a cinch that we are never going to form an image on screen. So this is not going to be a real image. It's going to be virtual. It means we'll have to look through the lens to see it. So this would be literally like if you're looking through a magnifying glass at something, um, your eye would be over here. And then you'd be seeing the image over here. So let's go ahead and locate it. To do that, we're going to have to backtrack the rays, just like we usually do. And there we go. And there's our image. So since we can't form it on a screen, that makes it a virtual image. We do see that it's upright. 
and that is magnified. All right. So case four is going to be what corresponds to your eyeglasses if you are nearsighted. So it's just, again, all diverging lenses. So the tricky bit with diverging lenses is that since the focal lengths are negative, this has the effect of swapping the rolls of the focal points here. So I'll go ahead, draw in a little cartoon of my lens. Then I'm usually very careful to like just to remind myself by like writing minus signs or something that my folk that the rolls of my focal points are reversed because since my focal length distances are negative um, this is the focal point associated with the um, I'm sorry this is the focal point associated with the parallel rays coming in from the left they're going to diverge away from here and if I had parallel rays coming in from the right, they would diverge away from there. So we've effectively swapped rolls here. So it doesn't matter where I draw my object because it will always be in front of the focal point. So yeah, I'll just draw it, I don't know, here. And again, it's the same deal. The paraxial ray goes to the principal plane but now it has to refract away from that focal point there. And I have used dashed lines because I'm already backtracking this ray. Now the focal ray is going to be the ray that is aimed at this point here. So just putting in some dots to help me visualize. All right, so the focal ray, oops. There we go. Yeah, that's pretty good. The focal ray will go there and then refract out parallel. And then finally, the central ray is our truest, bestest friend. And it still goes through undeflected. All right, so back, so again, it's essential that we will never form this on a screen. So we're talking virtual images here. Um, so we, the central ray backtracks itself. Um, I've already backtracked the paraxial ray. So all that's left is to backtrack the focal ray. Right there. So our image is virtual. We can only see it if we look through the lens. It is upright. And it is minified. You can test this for yourself if you have access to glasses for a nearsighted person. If you just hold them like you're using them, like a magnifying glass in front of some print or something, when you look through the lens, you will see the print smaller. That's because you are looking at the image of the print and it is a virtual image and it is minified. All right. So let's just do um, one quick example here. Let's do um, a case here where we've got an object 30 centimeters in front of a converging lens with focal length of 40 centimeters. So there we go. Come on, give me my principal plane. There we go. So it's drawing in my 
converging lens. All right. So let's say the focal length here is plus 40 centimeters positive because it's a converging lens. And let's say that we've got a five centimeter high object. So H is five centimeters and we've got it located 30 centimeters um, in front of the principal plane of the lens. We always measure with respect to the principal plane here. So this distance here would be S is plus 30 centimeters. So what I would like to find is where the image is located and how tall it is. So again, an accurately drawn ray diagram will always be the answer. So it's worth your effort to draw the ray diagram and see what happens. So you can start by drawing the paraxial ray. That will go out through the focal point. And then we can go ahead and locate the focal ray. Something like that. And it goes out parallel. And then finally, the central ray is our truest, bestest friend and goes out undeflected. All right, once again, never going to form on a screen. It's going to be a virtual image. So we'll go ahead and backtrack the rays. There we go, something like that. And so then here is my image. I want to find what is that distance. And I want to find how tall is it. We already know, just from drawing this, that S prime is going to be negative because we have a virtual image. And H prime is going to be <coughs> positive because it's upright. Which is what we expect from a case uh, three situation. All right, so we can go ahead and locate the image by using the most useful equation in optics. So one over S plus one over S prime equals one over F. So we can rearrange to have one over S prime equals one over F minus one over S. So this will be S minus F over S F when we put things on common denominator. So we get that S prime is S F over S minus F. And again, when you substitute these things in, you gotta make sure to always carry your signs with you. So S is plus 30 centimeters, F is plus 40 centimeters. This will be over plus 30 centimeters minus a plus 40 centimeters. So this is going to work out to be negative 120 centimeters. So the image will appear to be 1.2 meters behind the lens when you look through the lens. Now we know from the definition of magnification that h that's equal to h prime over h and that's also equal to minus s prime over s. So here this will give me that oops that h prime is equal to minus s prime over s times h so we can go ahead and put that in. H prime will be minus, we still have to carry that minus sign there, minus 120 centimeters over plus 30 centimeters times plus five centimeters gives us plus 20 centimeters. So it has a lateral magnification of four. The image height is four times greater than the object. Alrighty, in the next series of videos, we will start um, making optical instruments, so we'll catch you over there.